Let's get started here. Let's have everybody move up to the first four rows. Okay, first four rows. So you guys are all set to go. Okay, first four rows, please move up. So that you're not so far away from Pastor Michelle. Hallelujah. Oh, you have to go back. Okay, that's fine then. Okay. Well, this is the workshop in Power for Hawaii. And um, I can I can say as a as a testimony that I've seen our speaker really transform Hawaii. I mean, things are, are really happening here locally, uh, assembling all the different churches to um, really, really make a dent in, in all the injustices that's going on here in Hawaii. And so um, um, she's the founder and director of Explicit Movement. Uh, she's been success, very successful in, in bringing different pastors together, not just to support this movement, but to be a part of this movement. I mean, if you go to their website, I mean, who's who is listed as, as a part of the, the board or directors or, you know, whatever. I mean, she's got everybody in there, right? And um, so we're, we're just so privileged to have her here, um, Pastor Michelle Okimura. Uh, she also is an associate pastor as well, along with her husband, pastoring a church. And um, so, so she's, she's busy, okay? But she just loves the vision of this house. And to have her a part of this conference has been a privilege. So uh, why don't you put your hands together for Pastor Michelle Okimura. Thank you. Oh, such an honor to be here. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Um, just before I begin, um, there's a yellow sheet. If you could fill it out, if you would love to be on our email list, we would love to connect with you, keep you in the loop of events coming up or, you know, materials that, that we have coming up and being made. Um, we'd just love to connect with you. Um, I, I just really love this conference. It's just given me so many revel revelations, and um, I'm just, how it even connects with explicit, um, you know, just knowing that you know, just being refreshed that, you know, as we're called out, sent out to disciple the nations, it requires the discipleship, the, the teachings, right, and, and, and healings and the signs and wonders of God. And, and I believe it, part of explicit from the very beginning when God birthed this ministry, he put, God had the nations on his heart. And, and, it, and it's just birthed in our, my heart and our, our team's heart to, to really serve the body of Christ and serve people all over the world. Um, and, and, and I was really, really excited um, to be here to share in our heart and share with you a little bit of ways we can serve you. We'd love to serve you. Um, I wanted to call up before, I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of Explicit. But before we do that, um, I want to introduce um, one of our team members, Pastor Marion Logan of Moana Little Gardens Missionary Church. And I love Marion. We just recently, this past year, uh, were, were invited to do a Pacific Rim Christian University course. And, uh, on, on sexuality and culture, and we just loved it. When God forced us to really de start developing some of these curriculums and messages, and Marion was the professor and really did a wonderful job. And he's, I want him to lay a foundation for all of you on culture, because as you are sent out into the nations of the world, even local missions, right? There's a culture that you're gonna you're gonna um, encounter, and how does how do we navigate? You know, culture, when we want to bring about um, just God's purity, God's holiness, right? And so uh, Marion will help you lay that foundation and perspective before I, I share about explicit. So Pastor Marion, let's welcome him. Well, good evening. Do I have any veterans in the house? Anyone that served or is currently serving, just want to acknowledge you for Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day, everyone. Well, I just want to say, uh, uh, first of all, it's, a, it's an honor being here. I was sharing, Pastor Terry, uh, the other day when we were in the workshop. It's, uh, it's real moving because when I first moved to Hawaii and I was with Chi Alpha, you invited me to your missions conference, and I know that uh, Calvary supported Chi Alpha and was... Uh, supporting me and I just wanted to thank you for all the time just support me and being here it's really huge so it's really awesome and uh so I wanted to talk about culture a little bit um 
and we can, I guess we can go to the slide here, uh, the next slide. We're moving, yeah? Yeah, so we're looking at what is culture. And so when you look at what is culture, oh yeah, why didn't I think? They've got a, they got a TV over there, I can see what's going on. So what is culture? When we look at culture from an anthropological lens, they break it down. They look at it like learned, what are the learned customs? What are the shared customs? Dynamic, systemic, symbolic. And I think that when we look at culture, we've got to look at all of those things, but I think we can even break it down more. And we can go to the next slide here. Culture really is what we make of the world. So when you go somewhere, when you go to another place, you're going into a whole world that has been created by a group of people, their customs, it's been set over years. But the thing about culture that's interesting is it's not a static thing. Culture is always, it's always changing. We think about technology. I think about in the last 10, uh, in, in the last 20 years, for instance, the effect that technology has had on our culture, right? How many of you start getting antsy when something doesn't happen within three minutes, right? 10, 10 20 years ago, we could, it was more, it was more bearable. Uh, it, it's kind of funny, we were talking the other day, uh, I'm teaching a class at our church, and we're talking about marriage, and um, we're, we're with a team of uh, other married couples, right? And one of the ladies, uh, one of the couples, uh, they've been married for, I think, going on 30 years. And they were talking about when they were growing up, and he, he was so just, just bragging on his wife when they were teenagers, they were dating. He was this leader with Boy Scouts, and she would go with him, right? She would go with him, and he... She would ride with him in the car, and then he would go Boy Scouts, and she would sit in the car for two hours. And we're sitting there looking like, and you didn't have a phone? What did you do? <laughs> How did you survive, right? And so that when we look at culture, it's changing, right? It's never a static thing. I can move to the next side. So culture is what we make of the world. Now, here's the thing. Culture is this thing that exists where, first of all, we make things and those things provide meaning. The stories you tell. Uh, if we were to get, I guess, uh, into theory, we'd start looking at, there's a theory called symbolic interactionism. And we start to look at, when we share life, when we share experiences, the artifacts that we share then can begin to take on meaning, right? Have you ever had an inside joke with someone? And you know with that person what's so funny and no one else does. You know, that, that saying, well, I guess you had to have been there, right? That's how culture is because we're creating culture. And so here's the thing about it is we make things and those things provide meaning, and these things both shape us and we are also shaping. So here's the thing. When we are engaged in culture, we're being shaped by it. There is not a person in this room that could say, I I hear what you're saying, Marion, but here's the problem. Culture just doesn't affect me at all, right? And I would say, well, look at you. What, what are the shoes that you're wearing? Why are you wearing the particular style that you are? Why are we sitting in here, and why is, why is the culture here that we wear collared shirts on a Sunday night at church, right? This is created, and so... It's created, but we are also, we're, we're affecting change as well. So culture is this whole process where we are both shaped by and we are shaping it, right? And so I can go to the next slide here. Culture is not only a worldview or paradigm. A paradigm is how you look at the world. Culture goes even beyond that. Culture is not just in how you think. Culture is in how you live. It's the artifacts. It's what you create. It's what you're surrounded by. It's what you're interacting with. It's, it has to do with the language you speak. Everything. And so culture is, is it's a lot deeper than just a, your own worldview because your own worldview has to do with your world, right? We're trying to understand from our particular lens, but culture is bigger than individuals because there's shared meaning there. 
Okay, we could go to the next slide here. Um, I wanted to just say this about American culture, and, and, and this is, there's two things that I want to talk about it. First of all is we in, in our church, in our Western church mentality, we're coming to the realization, and we've seen huge shifts in the culture probably within the last 20 to 30 years. And so in the red, it says the culture is no longer, the church is no longer at the center of society in the Western world as it once was. It's what we used to call Christendom. And so uh, I remember there was a, a quote that said, if you want to know what a society values, uh, look at the tallest buildings. You look in the medieval times in the city square, it was always the church. It was at the, at the center of the city square. Now what's the, what are the tallest buildings? It has to do with the economy, right? It has to do with, and I dare to think, and, and, and this is what we're venturing into, What's it going to look like in the future? Because we're starting to see huge buildings shut down because they don't need office space like they did anymore. What's it going to look like in 20 years? And so, I mean, that's a whole interesting process in thinking of it in and of itself. But to think about that, we're, we're not, we've got to be more about than just trying to bring the culture back to how it was in the good old days, Right? And so that's the battle that, that we are facing in explicit is we're looking at culture and we're sitting here going, hey, we, we're not trying to take it back somewhere. We're trying to engage what is. And we're trying to realize that we are in a, in a huge monumental shift in our culture. And so uh, in looking at that in American culture and thinking about what we're going to do worldwide, thinking about... How, what we're going to do when we go uh, overseas, when we're engaging in, in worldwide missions, we have to realize not only in our own American culture are we not the center, but we have to realize that we have a cultural lens, an American culture lens. There are things that we understand the world to be. There are things that, that we, there are luxuries that we have, and then we carry those things. And so we have to realize that what may be readily available for us isn't always readily available to the places that we go. The, the certain ways of life that we take for granted, you know. A lot of times culture is taken for granted. We don't understand why we believe the way that we do. We don't understand why we do what we do, but you grew up doing it. And so when you go and you visit someone else and they don't automatically do it, you begin to think there's something wrong with them. When... In reality, there may not be anything wrong with them at all. The thing may be there's just a difference of culture. And so that's what we're realizing. This isn't in the slide, but I wanted to share this. There are some things that are cultural. There are some things that are what we call acultural. What does acultural mean? It means it goes beyond culture. It's, it supersedes culture. For instance, what is acultural? I'll tell you something that's acultural, eating. I think we could agree on that. Every person in the world, they have to eat food. That's acultural. I don't care where you go. If you go to Canada, if you go to South America, if you go to Africa, you go to Southeast Asia, they're all going to eat food, right? Well, here's the thing about it. That's acultural. What's not what is cultural, though, is the type of food the way people eat food, right? You go to India, they eat with their hands. How many of you have ever had that experience eating Indian food with your hands? It's pretty awesome, right? It was different because I, I remember having a friend. I'm like, well, how do I do this? And they showed me the proper manners because I didn't want to, you know, you don't want to look like a, an idiot, you know. Is that, I said idiot. Is that okay? Sorry about that. I mean, you don't want to look like, you, you know. And so, you know, I remember that, and then I remember when I first moved to Hawaii, there were foods that I, that I never knew about. Spam musubi, right? I grew up in Texas, right? We eat spam. If we cut it, we're eating it cold, and we're putting it on bread and having it with mayonnaise, right? Mm, doesn't that sound amazing? That's why, if, if you ever wonder why a lot of mainland people are all, like, sketched out on spam, it's because that's the way that they were taught to eat it. If they were taught to eat it the right way, 
but you'd probably like spam a lot more, right? Yeah, it's the right way. No, that spam musubi and the way that they cook spam really is acultural. It just, it's the right way. No, I'm just kidding. But here's the thing about it. There are some things that are acultural. Sex is acultural, right? I don't care where you go in the world. People got to do it, right? If we're going to perpetuate the human race, if we're going to perpetuate humankind, sex is a reality in the world. Again, it doesn't matter if you're in Canada. It doesn't matter if you're in South America, East Asia, Africa. People got to do that to perpetuate the human race, right? Now, here's the thing. When we're talking about sex and we're talking about uh, how to teach it, when we're talking about engaging our culture, we're trying to juggle two things. One is we're trying to, we're, we're trying to juggle, well, what is cultural, right? In explicit, we want to be culturally relevant. In other words, when we're talking to youth, you know, we want to have people that they can relate to. We want to have people that maybe it wasn't too long ago that they were youth and now that they're married and now they're talking about a healthy perspective of sex, right? We want them looking. There's a, there's a, there's a certain look, you know. Uh, Michelle, she doesn't want us to look like we're dressing back in when I was in high school in the 1990s. Although, I will say the 1990s look is coming back, which kind of is crazy, right? I'm seeing the flannel shirts, the Doc Martens. I'm like, the, the round glasses, that's what's cracking me up. I'm like, dude, we wore those when I was in high school. And they just look at me, you know, they're like, that was like 10, 15 years before they were even born. But hey, but the thing about it is, is we want to be culturally relevant in our presentation, right? But there are some things that are acultural. When we look at the New Testament, when we look at, at, at what God's perspective is on sex, for instance, that was a non-negotiable. In the New, in the New Testament, uh, and, and I'll, get, I'll get into this in a, in a minute when we're uh, going through the slides a little bit more. But in the New Testament, when the, the, the church started to, to begin to spread, right? We're looking in the book of Acts, and it starts to spread. And they're, they're weighing things like, can we eat food that's non-kosher, right? They, they had to look at that. And Paul was, was dealing with that. And there was the dream that Peter had. But then there's, there's their interactions and as, they're, as they're going beyond Israel, as they're going out into, uh, you know, as they're moving out into Asia Minor and, and going throughout, going out there, they weigh things. And, and they come back, and it was decided, there was, there was a couple things that they decided. One of the things that they decided, uh, no matter what culture you're part of, is it, it wasn't, it wasn't a good idea to drink blood, right? It didn't matter. In terms of Christianity, it wasn't a good idea to drink blood. The other thing that was, <clears throat> that was acultural was uh, sexual integrity. A, sex, a biblical sexual ethic. And so when we're looking at how we're going to engage the culture, when we're looking at what we're going to do, We've got to look at what are the acultural things, the acultural values that we're going to take. What is God's view of sexuality, right? And I, we can move a, a few more slides. I'll, I'll probably tell you uh, we can we can uh, move uh, we can move uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. We're almost there. Next slide. Okay, back back one. Uh, next slide. There we go. So when we look at sexual issues, these are sexual issues in other countries. What are we going to do? For instance, Michelle is going to be doing a mission trip to the Philippines. It's a different culture, right? So in the Philippines, they're dealing with, there's many pastors that are addicted to porn, prostitution, sex trafficking, high teen pregnancy, sexual abuse, transgender, homosexuality. Do those things look pretty similar to Hawaii? Is there a pornography problem with pastors? Yeah. Especially the younger pastors that are coming up. It's not too uncommon. We're talking about the influence of culture, right? The majority of young people 
are beginning to look at pornography at 11, 12 years old, and it's readily accessible to them, right? So when we look at Philippines, it's not too different. But what about in Mozambique, Africa? Well, they have a tradition. It's not necessarily something that we're familiar with, but in Mozambique, Africa, the tradition was is uh, when a girl reached her 16th birthday, right, it was cultural for uh, aged men, a group of aged men to engage her that way, to engage her sexually, right? That's their cultural practice. We're not familiar with that. And we can't dismiss it and say, well, that's, that's their culture, right? And so we look at culture, and I can go back. Uh, I, I think we can move ahead uh, to the next slide, please. We look at culture, and then we ask the question, well, how are we going to engage? What do we do? And so churches in American culture and churches in, in other parts of the world, they've created a separatist movement. There's some people, they look at culture and they say, we want to separate. And these are culture warriors. They're, they're, they're going to stand firm. There's others that are cultural. Uh, they're blenders. So they say, well, what, whatever they do, we're not, going to, we're not going to look at what they do and look down on anything that they do. We're just going to kind of blend in. So when you look at an example like Mozambique, they say, we, we don't want to touch that. We don't want to deal with that. And so they begin to... Uh, they just kind of go with the flow. But they're going to try to talk about God. At Explicit, our goal is to be what we call restorers. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. One more. Yeah. Restorers, they don't separate the world from the world or blend in. Rather, they thoughtfully engage. They're fully of the, aware of the sea change underway. They're optimistic that God is on the move, doing something unique in our time. We want to be a part of being restores. And I believe that we can be restores whether we're here in Hawaii, whether we're in the Philippines. Uh, Michelle is getting invitations all over the world for the explicit movement, whether we're going to be in England, whether we're going to be in Singapore. This is our goal is we want to be restores. We want to look at their culture, but we want to have a cultural values that align biblically. I want to end with this thought. If we can move to the next slide, please. The New Testament church was incarnate in the Roman Empire. What did the Roman Empire look like? If we do a cultural study, Roman cities were laden with violence. There was public killing. There was sexual art, literature, and symbols. We learn in ancient Rome that sex trafficking was favored. And when we're talking about sex trafficking, we're talking about literal, uh, slave, literal slaves. And when owners owned slaves... What they did is they looked at them as property. And so if they're using their, their quote-unquote property for their own sexual purposes, it wasn't even considered infidelity. That's Rome. It doesn't stop there. Pedophilia, prostitution, bisexuality, homosexuality, dominance, bestiality, public sex, community baths, group sex, lewd literature, rampant sexual images. We learn that dominance, overpowering, oppression, injustice, and subjugation was the norm. And one of the main attractions in ancient Rome were public bathhouses and orgies. The question is, well, what do we do? What do we do as the church? I can go to the next slide, please. We think it's bad now. Look at where the church was founded. We can go to the next church. And I want to end on this thought. We cannot escape the reality that we... Uh, let's go to the next one. Matthew 13, says this, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. Jesus taught on the kingdom. And what we are wanting to do in explicit is we're wanting to be in the culture and we want to plant seeds of leaven in the culture because as we begin to go, it's going to begin growing. It's the faith of the mustard seed. It's the leaven. It's the leaven of the kingdom that's bringing change. And we can, uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, I guess that's in. That's the end. The main thought is this. Jesus looks at the world. He looks at the Roman Empire. He didn't say, uh, hey, we can't, we can't do this. It's too bad. This, this culture is too bad. In fact, he takes his disciples. He's looking, he, when, when he reveals his church to Peter, he's looking at the world. He's looking at the gates of Hades. 
He's seeing everything that's going on in their culture. And this is what Jesus says. I think this is a good place that we need to build our church. I think this is the place that we need to bring the kingdom of God. This is the place that we need to bring the gospel. And so when, as we're looking at missions, as we're looking at what we're doing in explicit, we want to bring the kingdom of God where it, where it looks dark, where it looks desolate, where it looks hopeless. Jesus looks out at the world. It says uh, he was moved with compassion for the world. And, and this is what's crazy. He's not only moved with compassion, but he sees fields that are ripe with harvest. What do you see when you look out at the fields? That's the question. That's the question that the Lord has been bringing me. So we want to go out in the fields. We've got to engage, but we've got to hold on to what is a cultural and what values we're going to stand for. So, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. It's a great, great foundation. So I'm going to transition now to just kind of go take you back in time to share just a, a, a very smidgen of, a, of the explicit story so you get an idea how this got, all got started. Well, um, back in 2012, I was, uh, I was serving with my husband at like Spring Church, small church. Well, and actually not a small church, a big church with big hearts, <laughs> right? And, then, and um, we, um, I was children's pastor, children's ministry, was school teacher for many years for elementary. And at, in 2012, my husband said, Michelle, why don't you uh, take over the youth? Because it was transition. And I, I never had really much experience with youth, but I was willing to try. And so the first thing I wanted to do was have a camp, um, purity camp, um, because previous leadership never talked about sex or sexuality. And so we had this camp, and um, we had a lot of breakthrough, a lot of you know, vulnerability, and so much healing. And it, at the end of the camp, the last day of the camp, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Michelle, get ready for something much bigger in the future. And I had no idea what he meant. So the following summer, I did a, a middle school purity camp. And then about five months after that, um, I found myself in a meeting with about maybe 20 senior pastor men, and I was the only woman, and I was just, you know, like a fly on the wall in this meeting and just observing. And my good friend, Pastor Alan Cardenas, interrupted the speaker to my horror and said, hey, you guys, you guys got to listen to Michelle's Purity Camp. And I said, Alan, what are you doing? So, but that started a discussion, and the, at the end of the discussion, the pastor said, hey, Michelle, why don't you do a purity conference, an island-wide conference for all of us, because all of us do not talk about sex or sexuality. We don't know how, and our parents don't know how, so we need help. And so I, I sheepishly said, okay, I want to serve, so I'll try. So I basically didn't know where to start. I never did a big event before in my life, and so I just cold-called pastors and, pastors and just shared this idea. Long story short, um, in about one month, 40 churches came on board and said, we want to be a part of this. So it was almost like the Holy Spirit was already working in hearts. They just needed some catalyst to bring everything together. So if, later on that year, in September of 2014, there's a, yeah, there's a, a scene of, of what happened. We had a 600 high schoolers from around the island, different denominations. A body of Christ came together, and that was the beauty of it all as well. And we had 300 parents that did a parent track in another room. We really care about equipping parents and church leaders. So we also had church leaders uh, equipping sessions before the event. And so after that event, um, it was very, very powerful. God showed up. He was so faithful, so much healing and breakthrough. But after the event, um, I said, Lord, that was awesome. That was, about, you know, after five months of full-time work trying to put this on, I said, Lord, maybe we'll do this every few years. And really, that was the scope of my vision. And so it was a little unique. It wasn't birthed out of someone uh, who had a vision and a dream, and God brought it to pass. It was, it was uh, full of surprises to me. And so after that first event, um, that was the scope of my, my thoughts. And I got bombarded the following month with many calls. Michelle, you have to have another high school one because the kids want to invite their friends. And Brady Juista of Young Life, the head of Young Life, said, you have to have a middle school one because fifth graders in the... Um, low-income housing are having sex at fifth grade. And then we had, um, you know, the parents wanted to have their own explicit conference that had more equipping, and young adults approached me and said, we want our own explicit because we have different issues from high schoolers. And so I was now, all this demand, and I felt, Lord, you have to show me what to do. And he spoke to me. He said, do all four island-wide conferences the following year in 2015, and I'll show you how. And everyone thought, 
it was nuts. Because most people do one annual one a year. It takes a lot of work, right? And, and so I, I prayed. I said, well, Lord, you have to show me how. You said. So what happened was um, it started with the young adult pastors. They came. Marion was one of them. Hey, Michelle, why don't you be the mom leader over us, and we'll help to implement and plan the, the conference. And I thought, oh, this could work. And then the youth pastors came together, and pastors who had a passion for the parents came together. And so the following year, we did that. And what happened was um, it just I was so shocked at what was, God was happening. And in the beginning of the months of 2015, people were coming up to me and saying, Michelle, this is going to go global. I said, stop saying that. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't even know how to do a good event. Stop saying that. And I would shut people down. And just, just to give you a little vulnerability, I, I was in the car one day, and you know how the Holy Spirit can correct you. And so he said, stop it. In a, kind of a tone. I was like, stop. I was driving. Stop what, Lord? You know, and he said, stop shutting people down when they say it's going to go global. And so I proceeded to tell him all the reasons why I couldn't. And, and then he said, um, Michelle, this is my movement. I will do what I want to do when I want to do it. I'm just asking you to be obedient and open. And so the God then began the, the surrendering process <laughs> within me of just embracing the assignment, you know. And so that was a process. Um, and you can read all about my process in my white book, but just the supernatural things that God did was so faithful. Um, so, um, and so what happened was I said, okay, Lord, um, I'll, I'll be open. And right after I said that, we got invitations from Singapore, Canada, and Philippines. And uh, calling me and saying, can you bring a specific movement to our nation? We really need, want you to come. And I was not even trying to grow this thing that God created, this baby. And so um, it was just amazing. That you, you, I, from the very start, God had the nations on his heart because as we visited the different nations, we found that, you know, it's universal issues, right, that, that, that plague many um, of the lands all over. And, as, and the church um, oftentimes everywhere are either silent or don't know how to, how, how to deal with it. And so we really want to serve, serve that. Um, so that was, that was just amazing. Um, I want to just read a scripture. Um, it's going to skip to, yeah, just, just part of this. Um, Isaiah 61, which is a familiar scripture, but this is really our heart. The mighty spirit of the Lord Yahweh is wrapped around me because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell captives you are free. And in, in sexuality, there's so much pain sex abuse, porn, all of the LGBT issues, transgender issues, so much pain, so much confusion, right? And so to set them free and to tell prisoners, be free from your darkness. I am sent to announce a good new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen those crushed by despair who mourn in Zion, to give them beautiful bouquet in the in the place of ashes, and again, the oil of bliss instead of tears, the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known as the mighty oaks of righteousness planted by Yahweh, a living display of his glory, right? And that's what we want. We want to see God's people, his chosen ones, just be rise up to be all they can be in God. The next slide, um, transforming lives. We really want to transform lives, transform culture. We want to bring restoration, as, as, as um, Marion shared. And we really want to see young people walk, you know, in sexual integrity and lead others to do the same. We want to really put that vision in the hearts of, of young people. Um, and the next point, we desire to help remove hindrances, like I said, to, so that people can really arise because these sexuality issues um, really hinder us from really entering into the fullness of what God has. And um, this is a great, this is a great um, Ephes a scripture, Ephesians 2.10. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, right, God planned and advanced our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. So we really want to see that. Next one. Uh, we, we, our approach is identity healing and empowerment we really want to establish people in their identity in christ because as you know if you know your identity you will make choices and decisions from that place and so we really want to establish that further in people um, bring that healing to their hearts at broken hearts and to empower them with with tools that they can walk their 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 inter sexual integrity out and again we want to serve the, the church leaders and parents because they're on the front lines you know dealing with with the youth and young people 
Um, and we also, next, next point, we, want, we really care about leaving a legacy. We're thinking generations. We want to see generations changed, right? Um, Michaela Kobayashi, one of our just beloved uh, speaker team members, she shared this, and I love it. She said, marriages are the foundation to families. Families are the foundations to our communities, cities, and nations. And the dating lives of our young people are the foundations to those marriages, right? So essentially, dating lives can transform a nation. And we want to really see God move among the young people. Um, next slide. We, as I mentioned earlier, we, we really care about raising up leaders. And so we're so blessed to be, developed, be developing curriculum for that. And we had an opportunity to continue to grow with that in um, having a course with the Pacific Rim Christian College. And um, so we're really blessed. Next slide. We also wanted to... Uh, I want to share with you what makes Explicit unique, you know, in just like a nutshell. So what some of our things that I thought of was we really are a body of Christ effort. And God has just done it. He's just brought uh, people from all the denominations, you know, to, together. Because people will come together for the sake of the young people, right? And so that we're really, I love that, um, the apostolic heart that we have. And then um, also we parental involvement, you know, grace-filled in, in environment. We really care about creating a safe place in our events, in our workshops, where there's no shame. And we can talk about these things because God created, you know, sex and sexuality. And so we want to make it a shame-free zone, um, equipping leaders, as I mentioned before, and, and create a global network where we're literally the whole world. We can really create a network where we're helping each other with resources and testimonies and um, just really helping each other because it's going to take all of us to have a piece in the puzzle, right? Um, and then the next slide. I love this um, thought, and I want to just also see if you could plant this in your heart, that how does this fit into discipling and God's transformation over people, cities, and nations? Well, a person's sexual, sexual identity and sexuality is part it's not the whole thing, right? It's a part of the identity in Christ, yet a powerful part that is often neglected and without mentorship can destroy lives, right? The sexualized culture of cities and nations contribute to the pain and heartache of relational poverty suffered, right? From the very beginning, the enemy's strategy is to destroy lives and cities through the stronghold of twisted sexuality apart from God's design. And if you just think about the Old Testament, the false gods, Baal, right? It was all about twisting sexuality in how they worship Baal. And so it's nothing new under the sun in, in a way, way, because that's the enemy's tactics. But, you know, we, we just really want to uncover that and shine God's light. Um, ultimately, we want to see people free from those strongholds to fulfill their calling, right? And um, next slide. I did want to also share that uh, we, we are, we, God has added sex trafficking um, of our local youth, um, to and globally, we want to we want to bring this awareness, this equipping of to parents and young people and and church leaders on this whole area. And Pastor Terry will be sharing on one of our um, a little bit more information in, in his talk later tonight. But yeah, we really we really want to equip the body of Christ because this is something that is often unheard of or people are not aware. And so we really praise God for um, just pull, pull, putting that together. Um, next slide. I want to also share that one of the things that I want that as you go in to minister to people, we found, and I, I believe you'll find too, as a universal, I guess, a universal phenomenon that when you the power of vulnerability, when you share your heart, when you share your story, it reaches people's hearts and it changes. So at our explicit events or workshops, or when you share with people your testimony and vulnerably, um, and you allow God to shine his glory through the brokenness that, and the victories that we've gone through, um, there's, there's, that's being real. And young people, they are so thirsty for authenticity. They're so, they, they're touched, right? So we, wanna, we want to empower them, uh, and we want to influence their hearts and minds. And one of the ways is, is through the power of vulnerability. Um, next point, creating a safe environment that breaks shame helps the young people, helps even parents, right, to know, uh, all, all of us really, that we're not alone. And, and we believe God desires so much to break the shame in our lives, including all of us here. We all struggle with shame to different varying degrees, and God wants to break that. God wants to free us from that shame so that we can feel 
um, healed and restored and established his identity in us. First Peter 5.10, and then after your brief suffering, the God of all, our loving grace, who has called you to share in his eternal glory in Christ, will personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. Yes, he will set you firmly in place and build you up. So that's what we really, really care about. Um, Brene Brown, if you want to just um, go to the YouTube, she has some really great uh, five-minute snippets of the healing of shame and vulnerability and empathy. And um, the, she has this really great uh, saying that the, when you have vulnerability met with empathy breaks shame. And you can learn more about that because as you minister to others, it's a real key. And next one. I also wanted to encourage you to pursue your own healing. So all of you in the room, including myself, pursue your healing. As God, the Holy Spirit, shows you areas in your life that you need healing, just press in and pursue your healing because your breakthrough will be other people's breakthrough. Will be the, you will have influence and authority in the spirit as, as God heals you and restores you. So pursue your healing and have that courage. Um, I wanted to actually, oh, I'm going to land the plane a little bit right now. So I wanted to share with you a video um, that, so you can cue the video up. It's a five-minute video just of testimonies, and it give you a snapshot of God's heart through explicit and how we just desire to see young people, all ages, parents, leaders, just transform in this area. And at, after, after we show the, share with the video, I want Marion and I to just pray over you, okay? So you can share that video. Invite you to hear these. Hi, I'm Mark Palumpo, and I want to invite you to hear these powerful testimonies of how God has been transforming lives through the explicit movement. What started as a God dream here in the islands of Hawaii to see our young people walk victoriously in the areas of purity, experience healing from past emotional wounds, and be equipped and empowered to enjoy healthy relationships has rapidly become a vision for cities and nations around the world. And not just for one generation, but for families, as we realize these are universal issues involving peoples from every race and generation. So listen to just a few of the stories of how God has been transforming lives. Hi, so my name is McCaw. Um, one of the things that I struggled with in my life, in high school especially, was pornography and lust. Okay, Trisha, Mark, you got to tell us, what did you think about the parent track? Hi, my name is Landon, and I just want to read a, a testimony from a student who experienced an explicit movement conference. My husband and I, we do the Young Professionals Ministry together. We have about eight couples that have gotten married in the last three years, and all of them have attended an explicit event at some point. My name is Carla, and this is my story of just how I have encountered explicit ministries and how it has impacted my life. When I was five years old, I was molested at a really young age, so I carried a lot of like shame and just like bitterness at myself because I didn't know what was going on because the church never talked about this stuff to me. My mom was telling me about the conference explicitly and I was like, you know mom, I don't really want to go. And she was like, well, okay, you should just think about going. And so I ended up going to the conference and there was something that had happened to me. You know, I, I, I tried everything that I could do uh, to, to set myself free. I tried to manage myself. I tried to control myself. And all that stuff uh, began to fell, uh, fall right through. But it wasn't until that I found out that freedom was a person and his name was Jesus. I didn't even want to leave. She prayed over us parents for us to share our past. We knew that we were already going to, um, but she prayed for healing over us um, if we've been sexually abused. Um. Um, then when I was 16, I was sexually raped, thinking that I wasn't holy enough or I wasn't good enough to step into the church again. Right after that, my mom told me, you need to go to this event. Um, it's explicit. And I was just like, oh, I don't know. I, don't, I was still kind of shy. I was still a lot of shame. And I ended up going, and I remember just sitting there, shaking in my seat, like, why has no one ever talked about this stuff to us? This is what he says. He says, I didn't realize how much I'm not alone in my struggles and sins. 
I've been struggling with lust, pornography, masturbation for years. And from that, I felt so much shame and only shared the struggle with my mentor. This conference is needed for every high school student. It explicitly talks about many topics that are perceived as bad or shameful, so no one really talks about it. And that is something to me that sets explicit movement apart. It catapulted me into a relationship with Jesus. About um, loving yourself and forgiving yourself and, and just like how he's created these things and, and we're all beautiful. And I'm, I just like, I remember just crying and it began this beautiful journey of healing for me. Yeah, it was good for me because it was able to identify some things that I think are really holding me back from really just being able to love my kids and and just to be the father that God designed me to be um, to set them free and to be able to let them grow who God designed them to be. We have about eight couples that have gotten married and all of those couples have waited to have sex until after marriage. Explicit movement brought a greater change into my life that it can do the same thing for you. Knowing that like, oh, I'm not the only one who's going through this. And it, it honestly was like, we can walk this out together. That's honestly what really changed my life. Thank you. Marion and I just want to pray a blessing over you. So if you can stand, we just want to pray. So please join us. Lord, I just come before you, Lord. I pray a blessing over uh, this, this church, but everyone that is involved, because I know it's beyond uh, Calvary Assembly of God. There's a number of churches, a number of ministries that are here. And Lord, I just pray your blessing upon them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that uh, you, will, you will plant a leaven, Lord, uh, that you will plant small seeds, Lord, in, in their hearts and in their lives, Lord, and that they will be people, Lord, that will, uh, they'll, they'll first start within themselves that they're seeking healing, Lord, that they're getting healing for any kind of sexual depravity that they're going through, Lord, any, any healing of, of things that have happened in the past, Lord, of dealing with uh, their own addictions and you know, pursuing wholeness, Lord. I, I pray that it begins there, Lord, and that it moves the families, Lord, that husbands and wives will, will be able to open up with each other, Lord, and healing can happen between them, but then openness with children, Lord. I pray that that will happen, Lord, and, and that this will move into our cities and communities, Lord. And from our cities and communities, Lord, that there will be, there will be a number of, of transformed families, Lord, people that, that are going through... Uh, a, a great change, Lord, and then it'll move, uh, and, and, and we'll see impact in our schools, Lord. We'll see impact in our culture, Lord, and it'll move beyond cities, Lord, and it'll go to uh, statewide. It'll go to nations, Lord, and nations will be impacted with, uh, with your, your kingdom ethic of sexuality, Lord. And so we just pray for that. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, and I also just agree with him and with Marion, Pastor Marion. And Lord, I thank you that you're coming back for a bride that is healed and healthy and holy. And Lord Jesus, that we can be part, Father, of just bringing that to pass, Lord, as we sow into the cultures, Lord, with your love and your light. And Lord, I just thank you that, um, you know, we've, co we've covered many burdens, burdensome issues, but Lord, at the same time, Sex and sexuality is an amazing, beautiful, pleasurable blessing, Father, that you blessed people with, Father, in the context of marriage. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that we can embrace and celebrate who, that this gift, Father, and that we can be able to spread this revelation, Father, that would change nations, Father, for your glory, Lord God, and for all for your glory. We lift your name up, Lord Jesus. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Please visit our, our table. We have resources, a 21-day journal that can help a lot of people, and yeah, we'll be there. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Michelle, let's give her a hand again. So in 10 minutes, we will start our closing service, okay? Closing service in 10 minutes.